That's all. This light is not coming. Good evening, brothers and sisters. This is a TOS session with the subject a life active, a life active altruism. Very important subject. Theosophy has been defined by our founder, H. P. Blavatsky, as altruism. So unless it is practice, it is of no value. Very important subject. We have got three very distinguished speaker. Lewick Michael Ironside, Dr. Revati of RDR, and our beloved International Secretary of TOS, Nancy Secrets. I will first invite Brother Luke Michael Ironside, originally from UK. Luke has lectured extensively at Theosophical Lodges and groups in England, India, and Philippines. Along, among this has delivered lecture at the History Leeds Theosophical Society and at the School of the Wisdom in Adia. He has the facilitator of the Yacht Forum in, 19, in 141 International Convention of the Theosophical Society in January 2017. His writing has appeared in the Theosophical journals around the world. He has recently completed his first full-length book titled The Nectar of the Theosophia, consisting of the collected writings of the lecture. Luke resides in Philippines, where he gives weekly lecture at the national headquarters of the Theosophical Society. He is presently serving as the president of the Panadian Lodge, who is, has just in, initiated its own at the Theosophical Journal, Brother Luke Michael Ironside, please.
respected president, brothers and sisters, fellow theosophists. It is an honor to be here before you on this fourth day of the 142nd International Convention of the Theosophical Society. I have noticed a certain underlying theme throughout all of the lectures and events here this year, which differ perhaps to some of the events from last year and some of the themes that were explored then. This theme underlying all of these different lectures which have been presented here is that of practical theosophy. We spend so much time exploring the theory of theosophy, the cosmology of theosophy, root races, rounds and chains and so on. And sometimes perhaps we lose sight of what is most significant for us as theosophists, the practice and not only the theory. One needs not look far to perceive the dilemmas that affront our world today. It is in fact impossible to walk down the street without observing suffering of some kind. And though at times we may close our eyes and ears to the facts, the problems of life will yet again rear their ugly heads. We are each of us entangled in society's web of issues, and thus each responsible for our responses to these, our actions or lack thereof. Simply stated, society is the outward expression of our collected karma. We are its cause and its issues the effect. Theosophy has at times been accused of attracting dreamers to its cause. And here a misconception arises that theosophy seeks to escape from the world and in so doing, retreat from the great issues of the time. A misconception that theosophists are rather too metaphysical for the practicalities of societal life. Too often do we hear this reproach that theosophists are somehow divorced from the great battle of the day, from that which touches humanity at its deepest point. And yet, this is far from the truth of what it means to be a theosophist. It should be clear to the shrewd student of these teachings that theosophy was never intended as a merely philosophical pursuit. Indeed, it is the duty of every theosophist to set right the misconception that his is an idle life. And this is to be achieved not by argument, but by action. There is a profound truth to the proverbial assertion that actions speak louder than words. We may here appropriately quote Dr. Annie Besant in her statement that it is better to remain silent, better not even think, if you are not prepared to act. The role of the theosophist in relation to the affairs of society is not then one of blissful escape in the utopian clouds of renunciative indifference, but rather that of a collaborator, an activist, ever willing to lend the helping hand by the means of true theosophical service. Such a one is a builder and a co-worker in the establishment of the ethical and righteous foundations of society. His mission is to set firmly the cornerstone of universal brotherhood, over which the bricks of social order will be gradually laid. This idea of service stands at the bedrock of what it means to live the theosophic life. It is for this very reason that G.S. Arendelle refers to theosophy as the way of service in his short 1919 work of the same name. The relationship between theosophy and society may be readily grasped when one recognizes that the application of theosophical principles to societal action results in altruism. Altruism may thus be rightly understood as the central principle of the theosophical worldview.
This, then, is practical theosophy. Altruism through selfless service to humanity, where one's actions are solely for the purpose of helping benefiting his fellow man. For it is in the pursuit of this path of compassion that one may alleviate the suffering of the world in those ways best suited to his or her abilities. By this, one may become truly a liberator of mankind. Blavatsky, writing in her second letter to the American Convention of Theosophists, says of altruism that it is the keynote of theosophy and the, court, the cure for all ills. This it is which the real founders of the Theosophical Society promote as its first object, universal brotherhood. When considering theosophy, in regards to its relationship with society at large, it is well to reflect upon the aforementioned first object of the Theosophical Society, this being, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity, without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. It is this idea of universal brotherhood and tolerance of diversity that rests at the heart of the theosophic perspective on altruism and social development. It is for this reason that to again quote the words of Blavatsky, true theosophical work is the endeavor to help others. The mission of theosophy, therefore, is the gradual awakening of humanity from the slumber of apathy into the living light of altruistic action in all sectors of society. The current condition of our society is rooted not in order, but disorder, not law, but lawlessness. This is the karmic consequence which faces us on every side, and from which arises the mass suffering and discontent that bears striking witness to the failure of our modern civilization. The mass is first for the sweet nectar of brotherhood and justice, and yet find their cups filled instead with the bitter waters of discontent. From this is bred the hatred and malice that so plague our present society. Action born of anger results in repression born of suspicion. And so the cycle continues without end, from one revolution or act of violence to the next. A natural state of unity and coexistence with our fellow kin is daily contradicted in our societal lives. Until that brutish point is reached where brother turns against brother, father against son. The mass disdain for natural law threatens to set ablaze the very constructs of our society, to burn to ashes the systems by which we interact one with another. Yet, as the Hindu cosmology so articulate, articulately teaches, it is only by the destructive principle of Shiva that the grounds may be cleared for the emergence of something new. Perhaps from the wreckage of our war-torn world, we may attempt anew to build a civilization, one founded upon the ideal and fact of universal brotherhood and the fundamental oneness of life. The one point on which we can all agree is that the, the current state of affairs is a dissatisfactory one. And yet the process by which we bring about change is an issue of contention. By what method then may we begin to move forward in our quest for progress? And where lies the common ground on which we may each of us stand? The change must begin as an internal one. We must first aim to train and discipline ourselves before we seek to confront all the challenges of the world. In our immediate circles, we can place before our associates those ideals that shall be so clearly of noble character, so evidently wise, so pure of intention, that they shall win the loyalty of the intellect whilst likewise gratifying the hankerings of the heart. 
Those things which are of an intellectual and spiritual nature must be set in the place of materialistic urges upon the altar of our attention. That man may emerge from his infantile state in the gold chests of his lower nature and thus ascend towards the real gold of the spirit that lies shimmering upon the horizon of his potential. This change occurs with the recognition of the lust for luxury and wealth, the multiplicity of materialistic wants, as being the mark of an inferior development in consciousness. Here the low and the base are understood for what they are, the muddy ground at the base of the mountaintop of man's evolution, through which one must toil to climb to greater heights of spiritual attainment. The desire for material goods is rooted in the condition of combat and competition. This being for the reason that material goods are finite and limited. And thus, inequality in terms of material wealth is a necessary condition of a materialistic society. Possession by one individual or group of a material good excludes possession by another. Thus, conflict occurs. Progress towards peace must therefore necessarily arise through an appeal to the intellectual and spiritual aspects of life, and not that of materialistic gain. We must, finally, foster a sense of faith in humanity and appeal to that which is best in man. The lower self is not the true man, nor the deepest aspect of his being, and even the man in the lowest state of development yet possesses some sense of duty and honor. It is duty that must be laid as the foundation of society, for in duty is contained the ideal of universal brotherhood, from which the garden of peace may bloom. The keynote of our current age is progress. We are concerned now more than ever with the development of human society and by such to climb higher upon the ladder of man's evolution. The majority of our human race today are yet in the fourth race and yet it is the fifth race that is leading this progressive development. The advent of the sixth race is still far on the horizon though it is this last which will strike the keynote of unity and brotherhood in the spirit of service to all. The fundamental reality of the unity of life is the central truth of the coming race. And it is from this understanding that we will emerge into a higher state of being. Thus do we stand at the threshold of a new renaissance of thought, one which is founded upon the cornerstone of brotherhood and altruistic service for the betterment of mankind. The doctrines of antiquity no longer satisfy the yearning of man for an understanding of the world in which he lives. The old religions have failed in their task, leaving naught but debris in the wake of their decrepitude. The advances of modern science and the progressive philosophies of our time have caused a shifting of the tectonic plates of spiritual mentality. And we are left with the arduous duty of building a new foundation from the shattered fragments of the fallen edifice of orthodoxy. But lest this picture of modernity be painted in too somber a shade, let us stand back for a moment to absorb the broader view. For it is a fact of nature that destruction must precede rebirth. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So speak the ghosts of departed creeds. And so there shall arise a phoenix from the ashes, carrying in its flight the spark of a kindling flame, destined to ignite the world ablaze in the fires of renewal. For indeed, what is dead must rise again, transformed like gold from the alchemist's furnace. And it is here that we find ourselves in this present age of uncertainty, the temples of the future must be raised from the rubble, and this task falls to us. Those few, those few who seek 
the light beyond the veil. This is no simple errand, and the road ahead is perilous and obstructed at every turn. But he who perseveres shall surely triumph, and thus persevere we must. In our perseverance, we must raise high the flame of hope, keep ever bright our thoughts, and pure our intentions. It is for us who are theosophists to pave the way for the realization of peace, brotherhood, the bringing together of cultures, classes, and nations, the eradication of hostilities, and the recognition of our shared responsibility to our fellow humankind and the world we each of us inhabit. Thus we must prepare each and all for the coming trials ahead. The discovery of our role, of our dharma in the cosmic play, is the duty of every theosophist. We are each of us suited to those methods whereby we may have the most benefic beneficent impact on the progress of our society. Blavatsky, speaking on the role of the Theosophist in relation to society, wrote the following words. Every Theosophist is bound to do his utmost, to help on, by all the means in his power, every wise and well-considered social effort, which has for its object the amelioration of the condition of the poor. Such efforts should be made with a view to the ultimate social emancipation or the development of the sense of duty in those who now so often neglect it in nearly every relation of life. The Theosophical Society, past and present, has always stood firmly upon this foundation of service. We see this manifested in the activism of Dr. Annie Besant, in the fight for women's rights, as well as in the Indian campaign for democratic rule. Likewise, in the formation of the Theosophical Order of Service, which is founded on the ideals of creative and humanitarian action in the fields of education, social welfare, animal rights, and environmental concerns. It is in this spirit that we must progress boldly into the future, each assuming joyfully the parts they have to play. Service to one is service to all. And no act is too small or insignificant from the theosophic perspective. Every action counts, and the seeds we sow today may one day grow to encircle us in the fields of compassion and love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Luke, for your illuminative and informative lecture and presentation. You have covered from the ancient, from Siva and Ivesan to Blavatsky and give a quite combination. And I myself is too much impressed by your lecture and thank you. Next speaker is Dr. R. Revati. Revati was uh, born in a theosophical family at Adyar and brought up in this at atmosphere. We get this at as atmosphere once in a year for seven days and work for the balance of the year with a spirit. And that Revati was born in that place and born up and at the age of 12, he joined the Theosophical Society and started working for it. Devati is a doctor in the, in the child education, child nutrition. She is a child specialist. She served 30 years in the different capacity and now practicing at Adya for the free practicing for the benefit of others. So without going to the long introduction, at Adya she does not require any introduction because most of us when we come here, we go to her 
for our own treatment. So I now will call Dr. Rabuti to present his lecture. Respected International President of the Theosophical Society, International Secretary, Chairperson Bhattacharya Ji, co-speakers and brothers and sisters assembled. My life in the Theosophical Society at Adya has been a matter of continuous learning. The word learning includes learning, experiencing, correcting, comparing, and improving from one stage to another. A platform like this provides me with an opportunity to think on certain aspects of theosophical life and to share my views with the other seekers assembled here. I hereby thank the organizers for calling upon me to speak a few words on the great subject, a life of active altruism. On the face of it, it appears very, very simple because all of us here are aware of the literal meaning of life and altruism. The word life refers to the existence of Jivatma or the life force or the individual soul within the present body which covers it. The word altruism refers to selfless service are serving other people without expecting anything in return. Perhaps the word active, which is placed in between, is more important. In a way, it qualifies both the words life and altruism. Now let us consider the theosophical approach to the entire phrase as such within the short time available to us. All of us are aware of our motto, truth is above all the religions, satyan nasti paro dharmaha, is the great saying on which we have built up th this idea of placing the truth above all religions. While doing so, we are not against any religions, but we are for an in-depth consideration of the laws of every religion until we find the basic truth of that religion. Our happy conclusion is that truth is the same in whichever religion it is discovered. That is the reason why we have marched ahead to proclaim the universal brotherhood. Now, we have no doubt about the truth, the driving force within every individual. Adi Shankara, declared that jivo brahmaiva na paraha, which means that the life force is not different from the universal self. As this recognition dawns on us, we have to think of shaping our approach towards our fellow beings with highest respect that it deserves. Every religion proclaims its own method of reaching the ultimate reality, supreme power, or godhood. But we, the members of the Tisal Society, are more concerned about our fellow beings. This is not to say that we have ignored the third angle of supreme power, but we treat it in par with the second angle of our fellow human beings. So we are very much concerned with our attitude towards our fellow beings. So far, we have understood the import of universal brotherhood. Having come up to this stage, we should be careful not to commit the mistake of seeing our fellow beings as different from our own existence. Logically, there is no harm in merging these two also. But this sort of merger has to come at the level of the innermost heart. The unity which is thought of here 
is not the physical unity. No, it is the unity at the mental and emotional level. The great religions of the world teach us about our approach to the supreme power. Some say that we are totally guided from above. Some say that we are guided by our own actions. Some say that we should love him and do whatever the love dictates. Some say that we must try to merge ourselves with the self at the earliest. The various chapters in Bhagavad Gita, Karma, Jnana and Bhakti Yoga explain these details. There are people who are afraid of pursuing any of these yogas because they are not sure of their ability to follow the dictates. Some have found the Saranagadi or utter surrender to the Lord as the safest method as compared to other yogas. But there are others who explain that sacrifice of these methods does not imply inaction and prescribe several conditions as imperative for Saranagadi also. The duality and unity of beings vis-a-vis the supreme power have been explained in the Upanishads with the example of two birds living on a particular tree. The bird which sat on the lower branch was very restless, looking here and there and moving from one place to another. Suddenly, it saw a bird on the topmost branch of the tree. That bird was very calm and quiet and it was sitting peacefully. Outward appearance of the two birds was the same, but the bird in the lower level was surprised to see the higher nature of the other bird. So it slowly went upwards from one branch to the other. It wanted to see that bird from close quarters and it became one with that bird. This is how the Jivatma becomes one with Paramatma as explained in Sanatana Dharma. This logic applies to any number of birds sitting in the lower branch of the tree. They should ultimately climb up and unite themselves as one. This explains the unity of life. Having read all these viewpoints, I feel that the teaching of theosophy to identify the fellow beings as one with ourselves is the ultimate truth. This is not to undermine all the methods mentioned above, no. To make them simple and practicable, we have tried to discover God would also within our brotherhood. This idea is also found in the ancient religion when it says that the bird in the highest level can also come down seeking to uplift the bird or birds in the lower level. This phenomena is compared to passing clouds that rains over the mountains and also valleys without any discrimination. Thus, it justifies and strengthens the theosophical approach of service to fellow beings are most essential. This brings us to the area of considering our own approach towards our fellow beings. Specialization of any subject means you know more and more about lesser and lesser things. Our universal brotherhood may appear to be a simple concept, but it requires our entire energy to correctly understand it and to successfully live up to it. As our former president, Srimati Radha Bernier points out, there must be a change in our conscience to accept the universal brotherhood without distinction. And it will be a revolutionary change in consciousness. The members of the TS do well to consider the karma, jnana, and bhakti yoga not with a view to upgrade ourselves to some unknown state, no, but to upgrade our relationship with our fellow beings. I think this is the virtual contribution of theosophy to the ancient religious thought. 
one may wonder as to how these loftiest ideals can be practiced in our day-to-day -day activities with our brethren. One may even say that it is impossible to do so because we are afraid of following these methods even when the goal appears to be the higher and more attractive. Let me try to explain these aspects in few more words. We are familiar with Karma Yoga, which says that it is impossible for any man to sit qu quietly without doing any work. Assuming that one is sitting on a chair continuously for three hours or so, you should be remembered that the mind goes on to various places of the world, thinks of so many ideas without any control. Our scriptures constantly teach us various methods of controlling our thoughts. Almost every religion prescribes meditation as the means for controlling our thoughts. It should be our endeavor to divert these thoughts towards our fellow beings. We must constantly think about their welfare, their problems, and their requirements, and about the possibility of our doing something to improve their conditions. One may ask whether such thinking alone would help them. Our theosophy answers this question with an emphatic yes. I would like to draw your attention to the master's words as quoted by Alkyon in the At the Feet of the Master. I quote, use your thought power every day for good purposes. Be a force in the direction of evolution. Think each day of someone whom you know to be in sorrow or suffering or in need of help. Pour out loving thought upon him. A new entrant to theosophy may even wonder whether our, our thought process is really so powerful in changing the circumstances of other beings. The great religions of the world agree that our thought do have such a power. Yat bhavam tat bhavati is the old dictum. I therefore urge the members here to direct your thought for the welfare of other beings. The second aspect is about the action. One need not think that sending our thoughts alone will do. No, that is the first step. The second step is to follow it up with suitable action. Here again, there is certain conditions. The first one is they must be in the right direction as dictated by our right thought. It should be clearly understood that all our thoughts as well as our actions are open to scrutiny by an all-pervasive power. Neither can we conceal our thoughts, nor can we conceal our actions. Every action is capable of acting upon others as well as reacting on ourselves, the karmic law. So we should not only exercise care in our thoughts, but also follow it up with our action by using all the skills at our command. Even a small work taken up on the hand should be completed with perfection it needs. The greatness of the work is judged not by its magnitude, but by its perfection. We should do it with the spirit of doing the work as master's service. Any mistake of taking pride in doing this service or any mistake of expecting a return benefit only will land us in trouble. This is the condition that we members of the Thesaur Society should bear in mind while trying to serve others. At this stage, one may easily ask a question as to why we should not expect the result. What is the harm in expecting a reward for the good work we have done? Is it not as simple as an artist or a musician or a dancer giving our best in the platform and expecting a big applause? Surely a musician or a dancer can humbly accept the appreciation that is given after the performance. But thinking of it before the performance will only result in doing the job in a re relatively imperfect way. That is why Lord Krishna has declared in the Gita that you have 
control only on your work and not on the result. Karmanyeva adhikaraste ma paleshu kathachana. So all these teachings have been given to us only to ensure that we do the work without expecting any result. We should only do it as a selfless service to our fellow beings. This is so far as the doctrine of work or action is concerned. There is another condition which is more important requirement to our work. What is that? That is about doing the work with love. We are familiar with the word love and its implication. It is to be clearly noted that real love knows only the joy of giving and not receiving. It is good to receive love, but it should be clearly understood that there should be no link between the two, giving and receiving. Any work should invariably be done with love as its driving force. Work done as duty, as so many people advocate, is inferior to the work done with loving heart behind it. This love, when it becomes intensely emotional, is described as bhakti. When this bhakti or devotion is present in any work we do, it will purify that work from the evils of egoism and ahamkara. Development of such devotion is the key to true progress in our theosophical life. There is a perceptible difference in doing the work as duty and in doing the work with love. Work which is done as a duty is something like giving food to someone who stretches his hands and moving away from the scene. Whereas the work done with love is something like an affectionate mother feeding her child according to the child's taste and requirements. After having considered all this, we will naturally ask a question as to the possibility of extending such a service to every person known or unknown, big or small, good or bad, etc. Our theosophical literature insists on unity of life in all the beings, irrespective of their size or nature. Gita Acharya says that he pervades the entire universe and resides in all the beings. He is Antaryami. He is to be seen as the force that resides in all the beings, thereby reinforcing the feeling of oneness which should enable us to effectively pursue the path of universal brotherhood unless we thoroughly understand and appreciate this unity of life we will not be able to extend our helping hands to all these beings. It requires a lot of patience and perseverance to drive our own mind to render service to all beings. It is easy to love our family or our neighbors. It is easy to help them. But is it that much easy to help other beings also? A lot of knowledge about the unity of life a strong conviction about the theory of evolution and a very deep understanding of the nature's law are required to nurse our own large-heartedness. It is easy to preach these ideals, but it is very difficult to practice them. At the same time, we do come across such great people who can be remembered as role models in doing selfless service. An ancient king in South India was about to take his chariot on an urgent mission. But when he found a creeper growing on it, he left the chariot there to enable the creeper to grow with its support. Similarly, a Tamil saint called Ramalinga Adigalar was called as Vallalar. I am to tell you that Vallalar was the forerunner. Actually, he foretold the coming of our founders and establishment of this great organization for brotherhood. So he emotionally wrote that his heart withered whenever he saw the tender crops withering for want of rains. Such is the love that is expected to flow from the noble hearts whenever they come to know about the suffering of even the plants. The story of one Acharya called Anantacharya who lived in Tirupati Hills in Andhra Pradesh long back is worth remembering now. 
while he was plucking flowers in his garden, he saw a snake suffering from thorns stuck in its mouth. He knows that it's a poisonous snake and it may even cost his life if he goes near the snake. But at the same time, his loving heart did not permit him to go away from the sight. He, his conviction about the unity of life did not allow him to leave the place and leave the snake to suffer like that. He knew that it was its nature to be poisonous and it was not its fault. He was not afraid of going near the snake because of his unquaring selflessness. He readily went near the snake and softly took his head in his hand, gently pulled out the thorn and allowed it to go into the garden freely. We may very well compare the story with our own behavior in such circumstances. Our knowledge of theosophy should help us ultimately to rise up to the level of serving other beings with absolute readiness, love, compassion, and sacrifice. Having spoken so far about the ingredients that go with the selfless service indicated by the word altruism, I'm sure that any average person would be afraid of putting it into practice. Then why am I speaking about these points so patiently? Is it because I remember Dr. Besson's words? The power of the speaker does not lie in himself. It lies not his own power, but in the power he is able to evoke from the men and the women he addresses, from the human hearts he wakes. Such a thing is easily done in this August assembly. We members of the Tisav Society who, have, who actually gathered together during this international convention is not to listen to speeches alone, but to gather strength to live the life of a theosophist. A theosophist has to live an active life of altruism. While the Tisav Society had been organized by our founders with a view to impress upon the people to inquire into the ultimate truth, underlying in all great religions of the world and to find for themselves the unity of life that is present everywhere. Dr. Besant had tried to complete this work by showing the path as to what should be practically done. After the above realization, surely it dawns on us stage by stage. That path is the path of selfless service. The details have been explained by her and she also incorporated that the object of the TO is in a way higher. According to our late President Arundel, the TS teaches the philosophy of universal brotherhood, while the TOS provides a platform to practice brotherhood. And our late President Srimati Radha Varni has said, the TO is not only concerned with the alleviation of suffering, but with instilling a spirit of altruism and compassionate love in people. So, brothers and sisters, on the face of these observations, is there anything left for me to add to the subject, active life of altruism, except making you to think once again on these lofty ideals propagated by our great leaders. I feel that it is also my duty to humbly appeal to you to make your lives nobler and nobler by serving better and better. Uh, Dr. Rebsi has given a very illuminating talk. She, him, she herself is a symbol of a life of altruism, as we know, her time the last speaker does not require much introduction. But one thing I now understand, from the childhood, she was interested in the para-metaphysics and comparative religion. And afterwards, she became, the ch in our India it is called Charter Accountant, there it was a certificate certified accountant, and she served for the long time. In 1980, she joined the Theosophical Society and started working 
in the different department. In, nine, in 2013, I had the opportunity to be at Waitan for the third international convention and with a group of people, group of Indians, and saw two persons, one lady, one gent. And I told my man, there's these two men, man and woman, they will become the, they will come up for the Theosophical Society. I saw Nancy at that time. I did not know her. I, then I told somebody that she looked like a um, SPB. And I understand that from the very childhood, she was very much interested in the comparative religion and metaphysics. She served as a, a, as a treasurer in the, in the department of the treasury of the American section and became the international secretary of the Theosophical Order of Service. We are now getting her as a international secretary of the Theosophical Order of Service. And before that, he served the America in different occasion. The second man whom I saw at that waiter in that conference is Mr. Tim Boyd. So I am glad that two men I saw and wh what I presume at that time has come to a result. So Mr. Nancy Secrets, our beloved International Secretary of TUS. Thank you, Brother Bhattacharya, and thank you, Luke, and Dr. Reviti, for your wonderful talks. I chose well. <laughs> to the Lodge for inspiration and knowledge, to the world for service and teaching. This is the last line of a quote from Annie Besant's presidential address of 1907. It set the tone for the work of the Theosophical Order of Service that she would initiate just six months later. To Annie Besant, duty, sacrifice, and service were the most, impor most important to Annie Besant duty, sacrifice, and service were most important. Intent on relieving suffering wherever she found it, she worked as a social activist long before she became a member of the Theosophical Society. Years before, in a letter to the TOS Convention in 1889, H.P. Blavatsky called altruism the keynote of theosophy and the cure for all ills. She also said, for real theosophy is altruism. It is brotherly love, mutual help, unswerving devotion to truth. What is altruism? Is there such a thing as pure altruism? What does it look like? How can it be attained? Is it possible to live a life of active altruism? A number of years ago, I was watching a TV program, a talk show. The discussion centered on acts of charity, concern for others, and what motivated this behavior. On the one hand, some participants said that people who acted in a charitable way towards others were selfless individuals 
concerned only for the welfare of others and without any desire for reward or return. Names like Mother Teresa and Gandhi were tossed about as examples of purely selfless behavior. Those in opposition stated that there was always some reward expected, no matter how selfless an act may appear. What do you think? Psychologists seem to have differing opinions as well. In his book, Out of the Darkness, Stephen Taylor, PhD, a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University in the UK, gives examples of the altruistic behavior of groups of people. He talks about an instance where in London, a bus overturned and people were trapped inside. And, and talks about the altruistic behavior of the crowd. Everyone worked together and somehow miraculously righted the bus just with their physical selves. He then states, quote, altruism and self-sacrifice seem to be typical human responses to crisis situations or tragic events, at least for some people. Wait a minute. That's wrong. How do I do it backwards? He goes on. Quote, from an evolutionary point of view, such cases of altruism are slightly problematic. As neo-Darwinists would have it, human beings are motivated by self-interest. After all, we're all the carriers of thousands of genes whose only aim is to survive and replicate themselves. We shouldn't really be interested in sacrificing ourselves for others or even in helping others. It's true that in genetic terms, it's beneficial for us to help people close to us, our relatives or distant cousins. They carry many of the same genes as us, and so helping them may help our genes to survive. But what about when we help people who have no relation to us, or even animals? We and the TS and the TOS respond to crisis situations such as natural disasters and to the human survivors of these events and refugees from war or discord between or within nations. Both financial assistance and hands-on aid has been given to those who need it for earthquake, flood, and cyclone relief in such places as the Philippines. Nepal, Italy, the United States, and Chennai, India. Likewise, the Italian TOS has given much assistance to Syrian refugees in the past couple of years and continues to do so, with financial aid coming to them from the TOS in other sections. I've learned that the Italian TOS is planning a trip to Turkey in April to aid 30 specific families of Syrian refugees with food, firewood, and other necessary items. They want to see for themselves what is needed and how they can be most beneficial to their brothers and sisters who are, in fact, strangers, as neo-Darwinists would have it. Moreover, their mission is being funded with help from the Australian TOS. That was a surprise to them. They received a nicely sizable donation from the Australian TOS to aid with this effort. Very welcome. So help with help from the Australian TOS, people who are half a world away from the Syrian conflict. The Italians are hoping to get their TOS brothers and sisters in other European countries more involved in this aid effort. 
Are we born with a concern for others? Is it an innate trait for human beings to be altruistic? Or is it all survival of the fittest, as Darwin would have it? Neo-Darwinists propose that human beings are motivated by self-interest. They foster the opinion that we help on others only if they are related to us, thereby furthering a familial gene pool. Or we will also help, they say, if we benefit by it in some way. Benefits, they say, could include a desire for the respect of others, wishing to appear wealthy or beneficent in order to attract a mate, the hope of generating reciprocal treatment from others, or what theosophists would call good karma, or simply wanting to feel good about ourselves. The TOS internationally is managed by the International Secretary, me, it is present in 34 countries. Our principles of organization call it an autonomous department of the Theosophical Society. The term department is used loosely here. We like to call it the service arm of the TS. It is in fact headed by the president of the TS who is its ex officio president and falls under his guidance. The stated purpose of the TOS within these principles is twofold. The unselfish service of the needy and suffering and the inner transformation of the server. Well, the first definitely sounds like altruism, doesn't it? Maybe we're on the right track. But the second, the inner transformation of the service of the server could that be construed as a benefit? Strictly speaking, yes, it probably could. If it were pursued as a conscious goal connected with each and every act of service we perform. But I'm going to go with Blavatsky on this one when she spoke of helping the great orphan humanity. She said, quote, and yet, he who would profit by the wisdom of universal mind has to reach it through the whole of humanity. Has to. It is altruism, not egoism, even in the most legal and noble conceptions, that can lead the unit to merge its little self with the universal selves. It is to these needs and to this work that the true disciple of true altruism has to devote himself if he would obtain theosophy, divine wisdom, and knowledge." Close quote. Many acts of kindness may be motivated by self-interest, but it is not unreasonable to believe that pure altruism exists as well. I'm a great believer in fake it till you make it. In other words, if you act as if you are purely altruistic, you will eventually become so. Have you noticed that when you perform an act of kindness or your TS or TOS group works on a service project, feeling good about it comes only after the fact, not while you are in the midst of it. In the midst of it, you're just working. <laughs> or maybe that feeling comes only after someone else praises what you have done. You were not consciously seeking a benefit in exchange for an act of kindness. The inner transformation of the server is an unconscious process. It is something that cannot help but happen if our motivation is altruistic. It's like a flower opening to the sun. Sometimes, acts of service can be fun. A major TOS project in England is the knitting of teddies to be given to children in hospitals, those recovering from disasters, or impoverished children. Having a friend to hold on to can be comforting to a little one. 
members of the TOS in France also knit teddies and presented some of them to the children at the Social Welfare Center just a couple of days ago. Likewise, representatives of the TOS in Belgium brought saris with them to convention to present to students at the Women's Vocational School this week as well. Blavatsky said that, quote, the main fundamental object of the society is to sow germs in the hearts of men, which may in time sprout and under more prospicious circumstances lead to a healthy reform conducive of more happiness to the masses than they have hitherto enjoyed. Many TOS projects sow seeds, like this one in Bangladesh. In December, TOS members there distributed educational supplies to a school for impoverished children, as they have done before. And members from the TOS Secunderabad Lodge in India donated school supplies to students from the Alcott Memorial Higher Secondary School just yesterday. Representatives of the Indian TOS brothers Bhattacharya and Shiva Prasad, Jai Kumar, secretary of the Alcott Education Society, and I enjoyed the presentation as well. What better way is there to sow seeds than supporting and providing children with an education? The TOS France, jointly with the Liberal Catholic Church, sows seeds by supporting a school in the Republic of Congo in Africa. The TOS in Pakistan runs 10 home schools that are supported in part by donations from other TOS sections in Italy, France, Australia, and New Zealand. These schools in particular provide a valuable education to girls who might otherwise not be able to attend school. Many TOS groups and members help to support the Alcott Memorial Higher Secondary School in Chennai, India. In his talk a couple of days ago, Jonathan Colbert from the ITC told us that according to the Dalai Lama, if all eight-year-olds were taught to meditate, the world would be free of violence in one generation. Now that is an incredible thought. One, I'm happy to say, the TOS in the Philippines is working on. The Golden Link College has been providing transformational education to impoverished students there since 2002. Children are exposed to theosophical values at a level of understanding suitable for their age group. Meditation being one of them. The students in the upper left of this slide are performing walking meditation. Efforts are being made to provide a more theosophically based education based on the proven methods of the Golden Link College to the approximately 12 TOS run schools in India and to the Alcott Memorial Higher Secondary School. To this end, a conference was held in September 2016 in Odisha region. It was organized by our now international vice president, Deepa Padi, and facilitated by Vikhao Chin of the Philippines, providing children with an education based on truly theosophical values is something that HPB espoused. It's something I'm sure the Dalai Lama would approve of as well. And I'm happy to say that we are working on it. So to get back to our original questions, are we born with a concern for others? Is it an innate trait for human beings to be altruistic? The first object of the Theosophical Society speaks to the universal brotherhood of humanity. And the first proposition 
in the secret doctrine of the oneness of all life. HPB called brotherhood a law of nature. We are born with an innate desire to return to our source, to the oneness from which we came. This would indicate that, yes, we are born with an altruistic heart. In the words of the philosopher Schopenhauer, quote, my own, inner, true, my own true inner being actually exists in every living creature, as truly and immediately known as my own consciousness in myself. This is the ground of compassion upon which all true, that is to say, unselfish virtue rests, and whose expression is in every good deed." And quote, close quote. I don't know if Schopenhauer was a theosophist. I'm sure there's somebody out there who will tell me after the talk, but I am sure, um, but he sure sounds like one. The altruistic heart and the compassion of TOS workers is probably most apparent in healing work. Many groups participate in our healing network, which is now international. Here, names of those who need, in need of healing are held in meditation, and help is asked of the devas to assist in the healing of those who are ill or in their peace, to their peaceful passing. I would be remiss if I did not also mention the work on women's issues that has been a focus of the international TOS for three years now. These projects began of, uh, under the leadership of Deepapati in Bhubaneswar, Odisha, India, and Usha Shaw, TOS convener in Kenya, Africa. The focus is on women's safety, both within and outside of the home, fair and equal treatment on the job, economic empowerment through vocational training in various fields, and the education of young girls toward producing women of confidence and positive self-esteem. TOS groups and members in other countries, such as the USA, Australia, Italy, and France, have given financial support, as well as supporting efforts to protect abused women in their own countries. Many TOS members and others around the world live a life of altruism. They are those who respond with kindness, even to slights. They are those who work quietly, day after day, in service to others. They are a union of those who love in the service of all that suffers. Whoa. So that is the end of my talk, but if you would like to know more about the TOS, ask a member or visit our website at www.internationaltheoservice.org and please sign up to receive our quarterly e-newsletter. There is a sign-up sheet on the table over there. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear sister Nancy, your wonderful presentation, including some activity which is going around the world. This audience, I'm thanking the audience to listen patiently this, what is going around. The member of the Theosophical Society cannot remain independent by seeing the suffering of others. That is why theosophy is a Greek word and this um, altruism is a Latin word which is identical. It means work for the benefit of others. 
So this is, once you join the Theosophical Society, it is our obligation to do something. There is my request to all the members of this around the country, that where there is a Theosophical Society, there should be a TUS group. Radhaji, Radha Barnier, the former International Secretary, told me where there is a TUS group, there should be a, where there is a TS loss, there should be a TS group. So I thank you all. I thank our international president, Brother Tim Boyd. In spite of his busy program during the convention, she has come and inspired us. Thank you all. I declare this meeting as a closed with one announcement. Every year we are holding a uh, workers' camp, TOS workers' camp at our Himalayan center, Bhavali. This year also, two, three days program will be held during the month of May. So you can, con those who are interested, can contact Brother uh, Siva Prasad, K. Siva Prasad, our National Secretary of TOS India. Thank you. I declare this session as a close.
May I have your attention, please? This is an announcement. This is regarding cancellation refunds. Introducing our president in front of his office in Adyar is like introducing Mr. Barack Obama with, with whom he has many similarities in front of the White House. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Mr. Tim Boyd was born in New York City and lived there for 17 years until he left to attend Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. From there, he transferred to the University of Chicago, where he was an honors graduate with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Public Affairs. He joined the Theosophical Society in America in 1974. Along with some theosophists, he founded a theosophical spiritual community in Chicago's inner city. The group held classes on the ageless wisdom, meditation, and healing. They worked with at-risk and disadvantaged youth, transformed vacant lots of land into award-winning organic food gardens, and placed beehives on the roofs of local buildings. 
the group formed a business called Royal Associates that initially focused on reclaiming and renovating deteriorating residential buildings in their area, something he's still doing in Adyar, and creating housing for low and middle income families. Their work helped stabilize neighborhoods through the training and employment of local youth and the creation of affordable homes for area residents. They were indeed royal servers of people. This was proof of his innovativeness and ability to shape the organization he heads. His other great ability is to be able to speak on any subject of theosophy at any time in the simplest language which everyone can understand. Tim became a national lecturer for the TS in America in 1988, the president of the TOS in 2007, and the president of TS in America in 2011. Tim's involvement with the TOS and the Chushul Orphanage in Tibet led to an audience with the Dalai Lama, which resulted in the TS in America sponsoring his famous visit to Chicago in July of 2011, a two-day event attended by 10,000 people. The event raised 400,000 US dollars, all of which was donated to educational projects aiding Tibetan con communities worldwide. In 2014, Tim was re-elected as president of TS in America and later also elected as president of the Theosophical Society. He currently shares his time between Adyar and his new Chicago residence where he lives with his wife, Lily, and daughter, Angelique. Our president, Mr. Tim Boyd. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Pradeep for his wonderful introduction. I'm not going to go over again my uh, what, I had, what had become a sort of rehearsed commentary on my similarity to Barack Obama. Uh, but I will say that I am his elder, so any similarities are him to me. I should say one further similarity. He has a uh, highly involved, highly evolved wife named Michelle. And I think we're in competition there too, because I have Lily. <laughs> so in any event, all of those things are, uh, I'm thankful to Pradeep. I should say too, whenever I hear about this experience with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, all of the things that went into that, and you know, the end result being that everything that was raised, we so happily gave away. It wasn't required. But we determined from the very beginning that every penny that came from this would go to aid the Tibetan community in exile, particularly for educational projects that His Holiness designated. But I have to say, one of the great experiences of my life, and I think it's a job, if such a job existed, I would happily do this job every day. My feeling for it occurred when the time came to give away $400,000. To give a check for $400,000 is such a wonderful experience. I mean, I could do that every day. Uh, so, but nobody has asked me to do that. <laughs> but anyway, as always, I am very, very happy and continually honored to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with brothers, sisters, friends at this occasion. It's something that uh, does my heart good, and I hope that there's some communication that takes place from me to you. Obviously, I'm going to be speaking, and one of the things about speaking, we talk about a lot of different things, but I can tell you from the outset, 
if our time together is effective, you will not be hearing anything new from me. Which is to say, if our time is effective, the outcome of our time together will be simply that perhaps you will have the opportunity to remember, to reconnect with a resident truth that's within all of us. If we're successful in that during our time together, we will also be a blessing to the world around us. What I want to talk about tonight, obviously the theme for this convention relates to the altruistic heart. I want to talk about the heart. Really, I want to talk about wisdom, which is a subject that I think perhaps we, well, definitely we dimly understand, but wisdom and the pathway that has been indicated by wise people, by sages, by saints, throughout the generation. That pathway being the heart. So we'll go into that during our brief time together this evening. So just maybe to begin with, we should probably get a little bit of a handle on terminology. First of all, I should tell you, I'm not going to be overwhelming you with uh, terminology from any ang language but basic English. Part of my uh, self-training in speaking to people, when she was much younger, my daughter used to like to come to talks that I would be giving at the Theosophical Societies in different places when she was young. Uh, at first, you know, I think she liked to come because when I would be speaking, I would always make some reference to her. And, you know, after the talk, she would say, oh, Dad, you know, why are you talking about me? I say, okay, I get it. And so one time I did not talk about her. Immediately after the lecture, Dad, you didn't talk about me. <laughs> but what it was was this. After I would talk, I would ask her, you know, what do you understand? And what did you think I was talking about? And I found that if I could present these ideas in such a manner that it could be understood by a 12-year-old, this was my target. Because we can step it up or we can step it down. But if I can speak to the mind and the heart of a 12-year-old, that's good enough for me. So simple terms is what you'll hear from me this evening, and hopefully in a way that will be comprehensible to you. Wisdom. There are all of these different terms that we find are interchangeable, incorrectly so. When we get to be very loose with our thinking, sometimes we find that information, knowledge, wisdom, sometimes the line between these terms blurs. I mean, one of the facts of the time in which we live right now, you know, this is a Google fact if you want to look it up, is that they speak about this as an information age. So in a sense what they're talking about is the exponential increase of information, of data. So there are various ways that they put it, but they would say that every 13 months, the total sum of human information doubles. And this keeps on accelerating. Obviously, it's not something where anybody has the capacity to grasp it. But you'll also find in the same sentence, the people substituting knowledge for information. The two are not the same. Information is a basic building block. It's a fact. Knowledge is something that is structured out of these facts. It's a fact that this shirt is blue. 
so what? That's not knowledge. Knowledge comes when we apply a number of these other facts and build some sort of structure that gives meaning to these various building blocks. So there's information, there's knowledge. And very often, we, even as theosophists, are somehow of the opinion that this next step toward wisdom is really just the amassing of you know, certain quanta of knowledge. That after you've read the correct books and you know, the necessary poundage of them, then somehow or another, at some undefinable line, then you become wise. Of course, you also have to be old. You must be gray. So you know, I have the potential of being wise. I've read enough. I'm gray enough. Maybe he's wise, but these things are, they don't go together. Knowledge is something of a, wisdom is something of a completely different order from anything of the nature of knowledge or information. Wisdom is the perception of reality, the seeing of that which is, undiluted by the various sorts of illusions, by the various sorts of mayas, we could say, that we embrace. Unfiltered by the host of identities which we claim for ourselves, of nationality, of gender, of race, of religion, all of these filters which dim the light of wisdom to the point that it's almost inaccessible to us from moment to moment, ever present, but as a normal rule, inaccessible. So when we speak about wisdom, we're talking about, really, we're talking about a different order of things. So when we talk about the heart, in normal parlance, normal speech, if you look at the music that we listen to, and this is anywhere in the world, the movies, the songs, the literature, it's filled with references to the heart. Actually, just today, I received an email from the United States, and it began with, it is with a heavy heart. And when you read that, you know someone's passed on. I don't need e even need to go any farther. It is with a heavy heart. But we talk about people who are cold-hearted, people who are warm-hearted, people who are open-hearted, closed-hearted. We talk about people who do things wholeheartedly. And then we talk about lazy people who do things half-heartedly. Everywhere, our language is permeated with references to the heart. I mean, you can't go a day without referring to something related to the heart. This is at a superficial level, but in some ways, the territory of human exploration at this time seems to be this challenging area of the heart. So that's just in normal conversation. And as far as I can tell, I have been blessed, and sometimes I think maybe it's cursed, with traveling extensively these days, fairly extensively. And I can say from my experience, whether it's in Australia, whether it's in India, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in Europe, all of these references to the heart are the same. So that's at a normal level. At deeper levels, we also have references to the heart. So in the Bible, there is this phrase that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In theosophical terms, we speak about the doctrine of the heart. In 
Mahayana Buddhism, there is this ever-present mantra, the Prajna Paramita Sutra, also known as the Heart Sutra. So everywhere we look, at superficial levels and at ever-deepening levels, there is this focus on the primacy of the heart. And so it's something that we should point our attention toward. You know, as we go along this evening, I'm hopeful that perhaps we will actually walk out of this place with some sort of focus that we can either initiate or strengthen on our own behalf. I was, not too very long ago, I was listening to a talk. It was a talk that was given in 1965, and it was given by past president of the TS, uh, Brother N. Sri Ram. And he was talking about the modern world in 1965. And of course, Sri Ram being the utterly brilliant individual that he was, focused on it at a depth that I will not be able to paraphrase. But some of the features of what he spoke about I think are worth considering. One of the things he talked about was this fact that we're all aware of when we actually give it some thought that currently the influence of the progression of science pervades our lives in ways that we perhaps are not even mindful of. Science by its very nature and in the time that it has had to develop over time really has looked into every physical phenomenon that has come before it. Now, whether we're talking about the scope of the physical universe, whether we're talking about the minutia of the atom, whether we're talking about the biological world, the endocrinological world, the neurological world, it has all been researched. And there is information and there are descriptions related to every phenomenon within this, every phenomenon that is, that they are aware of, within the physical realm. I mean, we have to be very clear, it's something related to the physical realm. Similarly, the explosion of the deepening awareness that science has brought has also produced a host of technologies. Again, I'm paraphrasing Sri Ram and the technologies that he spoke about in 1965. So there is this technological impulse that has taken place. And part of the thing he spoke about then was that because of the new opportunities for global communication, one of the things that he was witnessing was that these global organizations are forming organizations which previously could not exist because there was no way to communicate globally, but organizations which, by their very nature, seek yours and my attention, try to place claims on your resources of various types, whether they're selling something to you as a product or selling something to you as an idea or their particular ideal. These things have become propagated. And we find ourselves living in this world of competing organizations, each competing for our attention, for our mind. Many years ago, right around the time of the founding of the Theosophical Society, a little bit before, the great American transcendentalist uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson made the very perceptive observation. He said that society everywhere is in conspiracy 
against every one of its members that the virtue which is most in demand is conformity and that in the end nothing is more sacred than the integrity of your mind. That hasn't changed. If anything, it has intensified. One of the other things Sri Ram spoke about was that as a result of these many things, the movement that takes place within human society has increased. Let's fast forward now 50 years from Sri Ram's analysis to now. Has there been a change? If anything, the change has been that it has intensified. The technologies that are available are much more broad, connecting us to information sources and people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was in New York for Christmas with my mother. And in New York, you travel by riding the subway trains. And it's fascinating to me because you get on the train and you just look around at the people who are there with you. And you know, it's probably not something that would stand up to scientific scrutiny, but my little observation, it's about seven to eight out of 10 people on every car of the train that are some way hooked to a screen. They're either playing a game on it reading it, or have the earphones plugged into it, listening. The screen and the device, this technology, is continually at play within the normal population of people. And I'm not complaining, I have an iPhone. Just got myself a new one. <laughs> but this is a fact. One of the other features, probably you know, maybe one or two of you may be aware of one of those once-in-a-lifetime events that occurred during your own lifetime, a monumental event that probably went almost completely unreported in 2008, when for the very first time in human history, the world was, became more than 50% urban, and it's increasing at a very fast rate. More than half of the people in the world live in cities like Chennai, New York, Mumbai, Delhi, Lisbon. The world has urbanized and it's on a track to continue at a very fast rate. So the condensation, the concentration of people within each other's presence in close proximity has increased. So the time that is available, the opportunities that are available to rest in your own aura, in your own environment, it is challenging to create that time and almost impossible to find it without personal effort within the normal situations which we inhabit. Furthermore, the idea of movement, obviously travel is a worldwide phenomenon now. Used to be when I was younger, we lived in New York City and my mother and father's family were in California. So when we would go to visit them over the summer, every now and then my father would drive all the way across country, 3,000 miles. It was wonderful as kids. But then also on a couple of occasions, we flew. Uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but it will give you some idea because it was in propeller planes. <laughs> and the stewardesses, you know, not the flight attendants, the stewardesses were all dressed in uniforms and skirts and they all had to be very young and very pretty. That was the day. But you would get on the plane at night in order to arrive sometime the next morning. Who would put up with that now? But also, you would get on the plane, and when you get on the plane, you'd have on, as a little kid, you'd have on a little suit and tie, 
because this was a very special and unusual thing to be flying. And of course now people come in flip-flops and pajamas <laughs> because everybody flies. There's nothing unusual about it. But the movement of human populations, the 25th largest nation in the world is a nation that has no country. It is that grouping of people who are refugees, who are immigrants, who are on the move, footloose, fancy free, homeless. Their numbers comprise the largest moving group of people in the world, larger than, larger than the next 175 nations. That's the time we're living. And movement also, it, we give it little consideration. You know, before these talks, people say, turn off your cell phone. But part of the movement is that the ether which, in which we sit is populated with streaming energies of human creation. You know, just turn your cell phones on and it's going to ring. Right in this room, all of those waves are passing through the bodies of each and every one of us. Human created. So part of the condition of modernity is in part a continuous exposure to non-stable energy patterns. You know, nature, one of the reasons why it is resourcing is because it has stability. It is cyclical. It is regulated. So people go to nature to resource. Human energy patterns are necessarily erratic. They say one of the greatest inventions of all time was the light bulb. I mean, it makes it possible for us to have a meeting this evening, but it also completely has disrupted the cycles, the circadian cycles that have been the pattern forever. So this is a description of modernity. This is the condition that we have. So while the great sages remind us about the primacy of the heart, we find ourselves in a time when our existence is somewhat dictated by the limits of the intellect and the organ of its use, the brain. That tends to be where we're focused. One of the things that was said early in the Theosophical's history, Theosophical Society's history, uh, it was in one of the Mahatma letters from Mahatma K.H. And the point was made about the Theosophical Society and the ageless wisdom's relationship to science. You know, we say religion, science, and philosophy are those primary avenues of human search for truth that our second object embraces. But we have had sort of a funny relationship with science. HBB in the early days found herself continually having to correct, modify, these limited and limiting assertions that tried to condense human knowledge and human existence to the physical plane. And the misunderstandings that she felt it generated related to the ageless wisdom, which looked at a much broader picture. But what the Mahatma K.H. said was that modern science is our best ally. Modern science is our best ally ally was the statement. And I think the idea behind that being that science by its very nature is necessarily progressive. Everything that has been understood at one point will be expanded upon and perhaps even discarded at another point. It progresses. And so the natural arc of this approach to studying the universe was assumed that it would come to verge on matters of the inner life, come to verge on the spiritual dimension of being. 
And so I think it has been with great anticipation that many of us, many theosophists, have looked at the progression of scientific thought and scientific study. And so as this most tested of all fields ever in science, quantum mechanics, has matured, I think many of us have looked to that as this best ally in terms of focusing the popular understanding of the inner life. Quantum physics, one of the, you know, some of the innately theosophical ideas that we find in this particular approach to science are such things as non-locality. So the idea that uh, electrons that have been in association with each other, they could be thousands of miles apart and what affects one immediately affects the other. You know, to us this is Theosophy 101 in many ways. The idea that thoughts are things, that they are not encumbered by space or time. The obvious experience of anybody to become aware of the sufferings of a loved one who's far away without hearing about it, without seeing the person, but knowing, feeling what they feel at a distance, non-locality. Normal experience, but an idea that is one of the bedrock ideas of this quantum physics. The idea of discontinuity, or what's more popularly known as the quantum leap. Anyone who has had any sort of experience of a deeper awakening probably recognizes that it occurs in much the same way as this electron takes its leap from one orbit to another. When a certain quantum of energy is radiated into an electron, it jumps to a new orbit. And the normal way of thinking is that it would gradually travel from one place to another, but quantum physics has demonstrated there is no passing in between. It's one place, then there's a quantum leap to the next. Anyone who has been graced with some level of mystical encounter can attest to this spiritual aspect that is described by this quantum physics. So there has been great, I think, anticipation that this aspect of science was the ally that we have been looking for. I think, unfortunately, perhaps at this point, it's not the one that is, uh, it's not a theosophical expression, but it's not the one that is bringing home the bacon. <laughs> it's an American expression. The one that is bringing in this new age. Because I think it's very, first of all, it's not completely equally understood among the scientists themselves, and certainly not among those who are not scientifically inclined. But, I think probably this best ally within science has come from a very unexpected direction. And it is in fact something that probably indirectly is having a profound effect on the appreciation of these deeper ideas that theosophy brings. And it comes out of the realm of medical science. You know, not that medical science has traced the outlines of the akasha or the inner worlds, no. But what has happened is this. In 1961, 50% of the deaths, 50% of the people who died in the United Kingdom died of heart attacks in 1961. If you had a heart attack in 1961 in any hospital around the world, 
you'd be brought in and put in with the general population, and the best thing they could do for you is give you some painkillers, and generally, you died. Or you didn't do too well. That was where it was at that time. 1976, research demonstrated that the cause of these cardiac arrests these heart attacks, was the fact that there were clots of blood blocking the flow of artery, of blood in the arteries, that produced, you know, when the flow of blood stopped, life stopped. So from that research, in 1977, the very first heart surgery was performed to remove these clots. By the 19, late 1980s, they had developed clot dissolving drugs as well. So the result of it was this, that people who ordinarily would have died did not. But more than that, at least you know, a couple of decades ago, the definition of death was you're dead when your heart stops beating. But suddenly, they were able to bring you back to life after the heart stopped beating. And what it resulted in was this explosion in the number of people who had these things that have been described as near-death experiences, NDEs. It's a whole field of study at this point. And one of the defining features, I, mean, I should say too, that these NDEs, these near-death experiences, it was not something that only happened to construction workers. It wasn't something that was confined to one gender or another. It wasn't something that affected college graduates more than high school graduates, more than people who had never been to school. It was very democratic. So across the spectrum, there were people who were having and then reporting their experiences of conscious existence up completely removed from and apart from the body. That life consciousness was not in any way dependent upon the physical vehicle that it inhabited. So, what does this do? I mean, the general characteristics, you know, when people who have had these experiences, and there are all kinds of estimates about how many people have had them now. I mean, some estimates I have heard go as high as one in every eight people. I mean, certainly if it's one in every eight people, there are many of you out here tonight who could attest to what I'm saying now. But the features that they found in common with this experience were, first of all, an awareness of being out of the body. Many people could actually look back and see the body laying on the table and report about what the doctors were saying. You know, common experience. Next thing, there was this experience of going through a tunnel or up a staircase, going toward a light an experience of meeting with beings of light, deceased loved ones. These are the ones that are characteristic of the host of these experiences. There is the experience of finding yourself bathed in an intense and unconditional love. Then there is always the life review and the imparting of knowledge about yourself and about the universe. And then you come back. Often people talk about coming back quite reluctantly. That where they were, they really didn't want to leave. But for whatever reason, they had to come back. And so what this has done is this. I mean, part of the after effect of this experience that now is the experience of millions of people around the world 
is you notice that they come back and they have a sense of purpose. There is a sense of a capacity for a self-effacing love that perhaps was not there before. Compassion, appreciation for life. All of these qualities that if we talk about the higher dimensions of the heart, these are the very qualities that are spoken of by the great spiritual teachers throughout history. That in some way, the higher reaches of the heart are experienced in this absence from the blinding influence of uh, obsession with the body. HPB made the statement about the experience of the spiritual. You know, how do you experience the spiritual? And what she commented, well, she probably said many things, but one of the things that she said is, in order to experience genuine spiritual life, you must paralyze the personality. A strong language. The personality must be paralyzed. The veiling, blocking influence of our constant desiring mind, of the sensations that we're ever in search of, of the body with its aches and pains and demands, has to be paralyzed, was her language. And I think there probably is no stronger paralysis than dying. <laughs> You don't get more paralyzed. That personality doesn't get much more paralyzed than that. And so this experience of a, certainly minimally, a hint of a deeper spirituality is something that becomes available. And countless people now have had this experience. And so when you hear someone talk about that, even if that's not something that is your experience, minimally, it plants a certain seed of doubt. Doubt about the firmness of this reality that people insist upon us accepting. The idea that this is a physical world with physical objects, that consciousness is somehow generated by the physical organ, the brain, it starts to become a little bit doubtful. And it's ridiculous to anybody who has had the experience. So this is something where science, modern science, has certainly become a huge ally, but in an indirect fashion. So part of the, excuse me, part of the uh, statements about the heart, not just HPB, but it's come down to us through countless sources, but in no uncertain terms, H.P. Blavatsky said that the heart is the center of spiritual consciousness. She said there were three centers in the body. The navel, which was the center of the desire nature. The brain, which was the center of the psychic or uh, psycho, the psychic nature. And the heart, which is the center of the spiritual consciousness. Now, what heart is it that she's talking about? I mean, it's very easy to think that this beating, pumping heart is that heart. But it's, it is not, or I should say it is, but it is not. I mean, Jonathan Colbert made mention of the Gayatri prayer, you know, the prayer that relates to the solar consciousness. And you know, part of that prayer, I think it was William Kwan Judge who did the translation that talked about the prayer being to that solar nature that is hidden 
by the disk of light. So the sun that we see that gives life to all physical organisms is just the covering of this deeper sun. In a similar way, the heart that we are familiar with is the organ, it's the covering of a deeper heart, but it still has its connection. And so I find it quite interesting. I mean, they've set up experiments, one which fascinates me. There's an institute out in California, and these, these studies have been replicated many places, called the Heart Math Institute, a fellow by the name of Dr. Roland McCready. And so they did an experiment, which I love to recount. I may have even said it here at some point, but I'm going to say it again. The experiment they did was this. They took a computer and programmed it to present photographs randomly. There was no way to tell what photograph would come up next. And they had people who were going to participate in the study and they took the wires and connected them so that they could have readings on their heart and on their brain wave activity. And so what they were looking for in the heart is a, something they call coherence, so heart rate variability. And so Dr. McCready, in describing his uh, experiment, he said the types of pictures they chose were two, in, two different types. One was pictures of lovely natural scenes, of kittens, of little puppies, of pretty little babies smiling that sort of thing, something that would just generate that kind of warm and fuzzy feeling. The other photos he took were images from battle in war, car accidents. You know, he said he tried to make it just as graphic as possible without just completely making somebody go unconscious from seeing it. And then these photos would when the person was wired up, the photos would just pop up, and then they would measure the reaction of the brain and of the heart. So here's what he found, that when the photo of whichever category was coming up, that just a slight moment before the picture came up, the brain was responding in the way that you would anticipate for that picture. So a little bit before the picture was presented. But that the heart was responding almost five seconds before it was even presented, it was responding in the appropriate way for those photos. The heart the awareness of the heart, it intuited, it was the organ that reflected the intuition long before the picture even appeared. So, scientific sort of approach to this age-old teaching that the heart is the center of the spiritual consciousness. I think perhaps at this point what I'd like to do I'm not going to hold you much longer, but I would like to perhaps wind our time up together with some quotes about the heart and something that actually we might even be able to apply about this heart. All of these quotes that I'll be sharing with you are drawn from uh, either HPB or one of the Mahatmas. The quotes that I'm going to be sharing are from her collected writings. She says, the heart is the abode of the spiritual man, whereas the psycho-intellectual man dwells in the head with its seven gateways. In the heart is a spot which is the last to die, a spot marked by a tiny violet light. This is also consistent with uh, particularly with Tibetan Buddhist practice, that the white drop and the red drop of the vitalizing principle center in the heart. 
Everything else fades away. That remains at the end. The heart is the center of the spiritual consciousness as the brain is the center of intellectual consciousness. But the spiritual consciousness cannot be guided by a person, nor can its energy be directed by him until he is completely united with his higher self. Buddhi, buddhi manas is the word that she used. Until then, it guides him if it can. That is to say, it makes efforts to reach him and to impress the lower consciousness. Those efforts are helped by his own growth in purity. The effort, however, and this is the part that I think where we get to the part where we can think in terms of what do we take away. I mean, hopefully you have enjoyed listening to what has been said, but that's very nice. But what do you do when it's not being said anymore? <laughs> therapeutics of speech. So the effort should be continually made to center the consciousness in the heart. So by continually would be meant even now as we sit to locate in yourselves that thing which you would regard as your heart center and to center your consciousness in that center. And to listen for the promptings of the spiritual consciousness. So obviously it requires a certain level of concentration at first so that the still small voice of the spiritual consciousness, it is protected from being drowned out by all the very heavy noises that surround us, some of the heaviest being our own thoughts. Listen for the promptings of the spiritual consciousness. For though success will be far off, you're not going to succeed tonight. <laughs> but if you don't start, you never will. Though it may be far off, a beginning must be made and the path opened up. And then she gives a very specific practice that you can engage in, in terms of meditative practice. And it's something that I think is much better suited for someone who has a theosophical background. So, with regard to concentration, she writes that the blessed master Kutumi writes, and then this is what he writes. Your best method is to concentrate on the master as a living man within you. Concentrate on the master as a living presence within you. Make his image in your heart and a focus of concentration so as to lose all sense of bodily, bodily existence in that one thought. To become so absorbed in the presence of this living master in the heart that that becomes something that is undisturbed within us. This is the advice of the blessed Kutumi as she describes it. So that's something that I would like to, for you, to take away from our time together. It's a wonderful thing for us to share. It is a wonderful thing to come, to sit, to listen, to go, to think. All of those things are great. And it probably will have very good benefits for us as individuals. But the fact of the matter is this. The Theosophical Society, this movement that we all have affiliated ourselves with, perhaps for different reasons, but always with the very clear understanding put before us that this is not just about you know, being able to develop personally so that we can live the life at the beach. You know, 
Personal happiness is wonderful and it's necessary. But we live in a world, and for whatever reason, all of us who are here were born at a time when the world has taken a very particular sort of turn, when there is a particular sort of energy of separateness that has become quite dominant in our surroundings. And what to do? Obviously, as individuals, we find the sense of being rather small, rather powerless, perhaps. But this practice, I mean, I started off at the opening, sharing with you the very wise statement of Dr. Albert Schweitzer that example is not the main way to influence others. It is the only way. In the absence of an applied theosophy, an applied theosophy that bears fruit, then it's just a study, a nice one. You know, obviously it's one that you will never be able to surpass. I mean, you could stick with it a long time and enjoy yourself. But quite frankly, that's not good enough. So this sort of cultivation, you know, the advice was from HPB, not just to center yourself in the heart, but to listen, to listen for the promptings of the spiritual consciousness that is ever whispering, there's not a moment where it is not whispering. Equally, there is hardly a moment when we are not blocking it with a noise. The sun's always shining, but sometimes they're clouds of our creation. So that's what's before us. That's the hope. That's the direction of this organization and the hope for this organization and the hope for this world. So I just wanted to share those thoughts with you. I'm very happy that not too many of you fell asleep on me. <laughs> but if you did, you heard it anyway. So thank you. Once again, thank you all. Thank you very much, Tim, for a very learned talk, which will, I'm sure, benefit us all. And you, as you said, I think we will be carrying with us a lot of the things that you have said. Thank you very much. Good night. This session is closed. <laughs>